It's an honor to be here again this evening. I'm asking you guys to stand to your feet, if you would, please, in reference to God's word. Let's go ahead and continue the second part of, of the study tonight. I'm asking you guys to just bow your head right there where you're at. Let's, let's just pray. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity of being here in your house. We honor you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the praise, and we just acknowledge you as God tonight. And I ask that you speak to our heart, that you speak to our minds, that your word will not return void, but that it will bring fulfillment to our lives and to this church. And Father, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. 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 You can go and have your seats this, this evening. So, the, the first part that we were reading last week, um, we, we begin to understand that Jesus is speaking to John and he's giving a commendation of the accomplishment and the success and the thing that the church was able to overbear. And it was, it was a, a moment of acknowledging the church for their success. And it's, it's interesting because the process that is followed leads to a healing process but before that there needs to be a sense of confrontation and so i want to i want to focus your attention on revelation chapter 2 verse 4. in revelation chapter 2 verse 4 says nevertheless i want to look at the word here nevertheless i have this against you that you have left your first love so when you hear the word nevertheless I want you to begin to just kind of dismantle this word for a moment because the word nevertheless means however, however or nonetheless. And when you begin to break down this word, nevertheless, it's, it's God saying this in, in these simple terms. I have somewhat against you. I have somewhat against you. Notwithstanding this general commendation, there are things that I cannot approve. I want you to think about this. How worrying it is to hear the Lord say, nevertheless, after being praised. I'm going to read this again. How worrying it is to hear the Lord say, nevertheless, after being praised. In other words, if, if you've ever worked at a job where they do what we call evals or evaluations, they're normally broken down in the sense of, You've accomplished this. You've been successful in this area. Um, you've shown improvement in these areas. However, these are the areas that I would like for you to continue to focus on and to improve on. And so now we get to the good part of the message, which is now God saying, I'm going to examine you. I'm going to break it down, but I'm going to help you to get to your healing process. The other word I want you to focus on is the word I have. I have. This word is very particular because when you hear the word, I have, it indicates that there is still a charge. That there is an outstanding balance against the church of Ephesus. So when you hear the word, I have, it means that there is a charge that is still outstanding. There is an outstanding balance. In other words, nothing has changed it so far. They have done nothing about it. So, when you begin to break this down, you say, how is it possible that this church was so fervent, was striving, was successful, but yet they had an outstanding balance? There are churches in America, around the world, that can be successful but yet have an outstanding balance. Can I break this down for a moment? There are people that are trained to preach, that are trained to sing, but have no relationship with the Creator. And so it's, it's, it's very easy to, to, to use your talents for your benefit or for your advantage, but yet, oh God, some interest rates. So I want you to think about it. If you've ever gone to a store and, and they say well, you, your cart well, did not go through and you try to act surprised and you already know that you have no money in there. <laughs> and you see people that do that, that doesn't happen here, right? <laughs> but there are people that try to say, well, how is it that should, the machine is broken? No, you know the reality. You had no money in there, but you wanted to see what was going to happen. <laughs> and so there are individuals that are abusing God's grace, mm. that take advantage 
of his anointing. They take advantage of God's presence. But there comes a point where God says, nevertheless, Joel, however, I have this. You have an outstanding balance. You owe me something. There is something in return that you have not yet corrected. So in other words, it's God saying, I've asked you kindly to change in this area. I politely come to confront you to remove this area from your life. I've, I've spoken to you numerous times, and now as a result, there's an outstanding balance. You know, I've always said this, God will never send you to a battle without preparing you. God will never come to a point in your life where he com will confront you unless he has prepared you. And what we understand here is that God was preparing the church to say, this is what I actually have against you. So let's go into this. When you hear the word first love, the phrase your first love precedes the phrase you have left. You have left. So in the Greek, it makes this first phrase very empathetic. So we begin to understand that Jesus is showing some empathy in the middle of the confrontation. This is very unique. Because Jesus is showing some empathy in the middle of confrontation. This is very interesting because some individuals do not know how to show empathy while confronting someone. But if you want to have a successful confrontation, you have to learn to apply empathy yes. to get a better result. Yes. This applies to ministry, applies to marriage, applies to your daily life. But if you're going to confront someone, confront someone with empathy. Have some sense of compassion. Yes. And this is what we get to understand that Jesus is saying, I have this against you. You have left. You have abandoned your first love. Yes. So let me break this down. They not only took their eyes off the Lord, but they lost fellowship with him. Mm -hmm. They not only took their eyes off the Lord, but they lost fellowship with him. It gets even more interesting. Because they had been in love with him. But they had fallen out of love with him. Let me repeat this again. They had been in love with God. But they had fallen out of love with him. You see, there are people that can fall in love with their spouse. But there's also people that can fall out of love. There are people that can be in love with ministry, but fall out of love in ministry. The question is, have you lost your first love? Are you still in love with God? Are you still in love with, with serving Him? Are you still in love with the thing that He has given you? Or have you fallen out of love? Have, have you lost it? Is it no longer there? Is that no longer a part of your life? So what is first love? Let's break it down. What is first love? And when I hear the word first love, it, it's typically the devotion to Christ that so often characterizes the new believer. So when you give your life to Christ, for the very first time, what happens? You're, you're literally a, a walking bomb. You're on fire for God. You're fervent. You're excited. You have an openly displayed honeymoon love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember when you gave your life to Christ? I remember. I was 15 years old. I was on fire. Every single person I would see in the street, I would invite them to church. I didn't know what it meant to pray or to fast. I just knew that I had to pray and I had to fast. I was on fire for God. My first love was strong. But you know what happened throughout the 20 years? I became complacent. I became comfortable in my own skin. 
I begin to rely more on my knowledge than my fellowship, my fellowship with Christ. So it, it now became a human experience and no longer a supernatural experience. What does that mean? It means that you can come to church and you can have a human experience. The music felt good. Did you hear that word? It was really good. But did you have a supernatural experience with your Creator? Oh, come on. Ooh, come on. You see, I, I've learned this, and this really goes to this church. Is that they had it all. They had a structured team, they, they had an outreach ministry, they were a large community, they were powerful, but they lost their first love. So what's the point in having a church if there's no love in the church? Come on. Amen. What's the point in having a ministry if you no longer have the first love? What, what's the point in, in, in ministering God's word if your first love is no longer there? That is the whole point why John is now speaking to the church through Jesus Christ. You've done this. You've accomplished this. You've been able to do this. But now you lack this. Here's a unique thing about it. When God confronts you, it's not because he wants to embarrass you. It's because he wants you to return. He wants to realign your steps. He wants to refocus your attention. He wants you to never lose the honeymoon sensation. My goodness, I think we all, maybe at one point we remember the honeymoon season of either your marriage, of your walk with Christ. I will never forget when I preached my first sermon in Houston. I was almost, I was around 16 years old. I had no idea what I was doing. My Spanish was all jacked up. I, like, I had no idea what I was doing. All I kept saying was, how many want the rain? How many want the rain? And I had no idea. And the church was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had no clue what was going on. But I was just so excited because I had the opportunity of preaching God's word. And, and I just saw God doing all these amazing things. And, and, and my Spanish was nowhere. And I, I'm sure they probably didn't understand a lick of word of what I was saying. But I was so excited that when I got off the pulpit, I was like, wow. But you know what? Can I be real? After five 10, 15, 20 years, it was like, mm, is it still there? Do you still got it? Do you still got that hope, that, that desire? She's like marriage. 20, 30, 40 years. Is that, is that love still there? So it's, it's almost like at this point, God is saying, let me check the temperature. Let's do a temperature check. So let's begin to see what happens here. In respect to what was happening here, there was a state of decline. There was a state of decline. And although they had still maintained the doctrine of faith and being opposed to the advocates of error, they showed less intensity of affection towards their creator. Let me say this again. They were in a state of decline. Do you know what this means? In other words, they were going down and they didn't even know it. Oh, come on. They were going downhill and they were not even aware of it. Lord, How many individuals are going into a state of decline and they don't even know it? Because you're an autopilot, because you're on neutral zone, because all you're doing is just going with the flow, not realizing that you're in a stage of decline. It's interesting because they had maintained the doctrine of faith. They were opposed towards the advocates of error, but they now have shown less intensity of affection towards their creator. Oh, Let me break it down 2020. You can proclaim to be a believer. You can proclaim to serve God, but your intensity is no longer there. In other words, that fire, that even before the music began, even before the worship began, it's already inside of you. Even before the word is being preached, it's already stirring inside of you. Because it all begins from within. I want you to evaluate yourself. Are you in a stage of decline or are you still moving upwards? 
Are you in a stage where even though you have struggles and, and battles and temptations and afflictions, are you are you going downhill? Is the plane about to crash or are you going up? Did you know that you can be serving God for 20, 30 years and still have the momentum? It, it should never get old. It should never get old. I wrote this down. Did you know that you can do ministry and not have a relationship with Jesus? I want to be real tonight with you guys because I don't know how many times I have stepped behind the pulpit not wanting to preach. I'm going to say this again. I don't know how many times I have stepped behind the pulpit not wanting to preach. Because I have issues. I got battles. I'm going through stuff. And it's like, I, I, I don't feel it. And I, I remember when I started to minister, when I started to preach years ago, I was like, I just don't feel it. I just don't feel it. And God, when they spoke to my heart, you, you don't have to feel it. You have to know it. If you forget this whole thing, remember this. You don't have to feel it. You have to know it. If your life is based on how I feel, you're never going to know who you are before the eyes of God. That's the issue with our churches. It's I just don't feel good. It just doesn't feel right. It just doesn't feel like it's going the way I planned it. That's the whole issue. You're the issue. It's because you don't know the one who called you to move forward in life. So are you in a stage of decline or are you moving upward? This is what I have against you is that you have left. You have abandoned. You have forgot to know who is the one that truly has called you to this time. Amen. Watch this. When the God that you acknowledge as God is not treated as God, then his kingdom and its benefits are not experienced by you. I'm going to repeat this again. When the God that you acknowledge as God is not treated as God, then his kingdom and its benefits are not experienced by you. So let, let's break it down. When, when you truly acknowledge our creator as who he is, then you will be able to experience his full benefits. It, it, it's literally like having a possession in your home that has so much value, but you don't use it. You literally have the creator inside of you, church of Ephesus, you have his presence, but yet you no longer use it. Because your church agenda has occupied God's presence. This is what happened. Their agenda was more occupied than allowing the Shekinah glory of God. And this is what happens nowadays is that your agenda does not allow for God to interfere with your plans. You are too occupied. You are too busy. You no longer have the time to fit God in your schedule. So when you do need him, it's like you forgot that he was there from the very get-go. So take, check this out for a moment. When you no longer not acknowledge him, it's, it's like his kingdom and his benefits cannot be experienced. It, it, this really, it, it, it speaks to my heart. It speaks to my mind. It speaks to my, to, to my life. Because how many times have, have, have I known that God is right there in front of me? But as we say in Mexico, soy tan terco. I'm so stubborn. I'm so set in my ways that I know that I can just call out to him, but I'd rather complain. Oh. I, I know that I can pray to God, but I'd rather go on Facebook and put my trash out there. Oh. Think about it. There's individuals that they, 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 they put a picture and they want to put a scripture next to it. All you want to say is that you're insecure, but you want to use God as your, as your excuse. Yes. Come on. In other words, the reality is that we want to use so many reasons to justify why we are the way we are. But if you only allow God to be the center of your life, life will, will make much more sense if you just let God take over and do what he has to do from the very beginning. Like, are you ready? Will you let me take over? Will you let me fight for you? Will you let me move for you? Will you let me handle it for you? Will, will you just stop negotiating with me? 
It's like this is what God was trying to show to the church from the very beginning. Thank you. I know you have a great outreach program, church. I know you have a great program. I know you have amazing activities, but can, can I be the center of it now? Can, can I reign in here now? Amen. This is the important thing about all of this. When you do not put God first, then you are missing out on all of the benefits and the blessings of the king and his kingdom. Right. When you do not put God first, then you are missing out on all the benefits. Seek ye the kingdom of God. Mm, Seek ye what? The kingdom of God first. The kingdom of God. This is important. Come and then everything else. What we want to do is first do the last part. First give me the job and then I'll give you the glory. First give me the car and then I'll praise you. First give me the promotion and then I'll give my offering. No, no, no. Seek ye first. Put me first. You see, this is the biblical principle. God says, come nigh unto me and then I will come nigh unto you. In other words, you come first, Papa, and then I'll come. But what we want is the opposite. Now God, come to me. Make me feel good. Make, no, 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 no. I want you in your own condition. Come to me yes. first. Come the way you are first. Messed up, jacked up, dysfunctional. But just, just come to me the way you are. And then guess what? I'll come to you. This is the whole focus of God's church. It's understanding what they lost in the road. What they lost in the journey. What, what, what transpired throughout their journey of life. Like they lost it. I can tell you where I lost my first love at one point. That I became so confident in myself. That I became so confident in my abilities to preach. That I thought that it was about me. I, I gotta preach. I gotta book myself. I gotta travel. I gotta go out there. I gotta make my connections. I gotta have these meetings. And I thought that all of that was me serving God when in reality it was my agenda. Come on. Oh. That is where I begin to lose my first love. Oh, it's okay. I, I, I can make it up next week. That's okay. We'll, we'll move on. But the reality is that I had left God way down there by Highway 20 a long time ago. You see, I, I will never forget when I was preaching in a church in Mexico. I, I was like, "Man, we got this. Let's do this." Almanos, and I will never forget that. You know, back in those days, there was no tablets; it was all paper. And I remember that I had my my my, my sermon and my notes. And, and and back in those days, they didn't have no AC, so the windows were completely open. I got it libre, and I will never forget them. Like, I got my message. I got this ready. Let's do this. And guess what? The wind comes and just throws all my sermon notes to the to the to the floor. And I had about seven, eight pages, and, and it, it took me like 10, 15 minutes to, to get my, my thoughts together, and at the end I just lost it. And I would never forget what, what God spoke to my heart. And he said, You know what, Joel? If if you would have gone down humbled the way you were, and you would have came with that same mentality as you stepped into that pulpit, it would have been a different story. But you came up so confident of yourself. But it was in Mexico, bajate bien escordito. In other words, you, you came down really embarrassed. The church, I was really embarrassed because there was all these big shots behind me and, and there was about, I don't even know, it was a full house. And, and I thought that I was going to do this. Not realizing that God was going to teach me an important lesson that evening. And it's this, it's not about you, it's about me. It's not about you, it's about me. So when you tell God about the thing that you're going through, it doesn't face God. It doesn't surprise God because he already knows it. But what he wants is, come unto me. Are you done complaining? All right, come unto me. Are you done? Come unto me. I want you, I want you to focus your attention on verse 5, if you would, please. I want to move forward with this. It says, just remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. This is now where he begins to Get close to the end of the plan. I want you to remember where you have fallen. So when you hear the word, remember. It's saying this, consider the state of grace in which you once stood. Consider the state of grace in which you once stood. 
Verse 5 is broken down in three words. Remember, remove, and repent. And we're breaking it down right now. Remember, remove, and repent. But the very first word he's saying is remember. Consider the, straight, the state of grace in which you once stood. How many of you guys know that restoration will always begin with remembering what your relationship with Christ was like when you first were saved? I want you to take a mental focus of that for a moment, if you will, please. Remember, I acknowledge. Remember where it all began. Remember how everything started. Remember, can you remember? Can, 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 can you take a moment to take a mental focus of that? How everything began? I remember when I was in the church and, and there was a preacher that came and I was around 16 years old and he came and he prophesied to me. He called me out. He was saying, you're going to travel the world and you're going to preach and you're going to do this. And, but after that evening service, I had to clean the church. I had to vacuum. I had to remove the trash bags and I had to get the church in order. And I'm like, really? I'm going to travel. I'm going to do this, but I got to clean the church. These people are so nasty. Like they just leave stuff behind and I got to pick up the bread. Like, are you serious? Not realizing that that was going to be my starting point in God's calling. When, when you remember those times where you were asked to do things and you were like, I'm on it. I'm on it. Let's do it. It's on and popping. Let's go. <laughs> but it's like, really? Why, why, why can't that person do it? Why, why do I got to go? Why do they got to do that? Why, it's, like, it's like now you, there's just a little bit of, of, of saying, but why me? And God's like, would you remember? He reminds me. Do you remember when you told me, God, do whatever you want? God, use me however you want. God, here I am. I said that Ramando Moco just is all out there in the altar. And it's like, okay, but I hold you accountable. I remember what you said. Your pastor said something on Sunday. He said, when you tell God, here are my plans, he's going to remove the, he's going to ruin your plans. Yeah. Because it's, it's not what you want, but it, it's, it's what he wants. It's what he's already established yes. for your life. Yes. So remember, I want you to focus on the word remove. The word remove, it means to set in motion. It means to move. This is where we get our, our English word cinema from the Greek word. And, and, and so what this means is Jesus will remove the church from a sphere of effectiveness or possibly out of total existence. So I want you to think about this. He's asking the church to remove. So if I can break this down for a second, what are those areas that God is asking us to remove? What, what am I asking you to, 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 to get out, to take out, to set in motion? What are the areas that I have to begin to, to take out of your life? And this is where it gets uncomfortable because God is saying, I gotta remove this. I gotta take this out. I gotta remove this from your life. Let's go even, but hold on, let me hold on to this. God, I'll hold on to this. God says, no, I want you to give me everything. But the other thing that's very important is this. It's to change one's thinking about something. It's to change the way you think about something. Or are, are you open? Are you willing to be open to hear what God is trying to speak? Are you willing to, to give God the opportunity to to say what he has to say. To do what he has to do. When we say, God, you are welcome, then truly mean it. God, you are welcome in here. Yes. God, have your way inside of me. Yes. God, truly have your way inside of me. God, do what you want. Then yes, God, truly do what you want. You hear that song? To break every chain. Yes, God, break every. Even the ones that are hidden under my shoes. Break every single chain. In other words, remove every single area. What was the whole point out of this? Well, at the moment the church repented, God was going to realign them where they once started. This is where I want to wrap it up tonight. That never, never did God say, I'm going to remove this from you. All that God says was, I want you to return to me. This is the amazing thing about God in this church. This particular church, he never said, I'm going to remove he basically said, I want you to return to your first love. This is the first thing about God, is that he doesn't take away what he gives you. He 
doesn't remove what he once gave you. What does this mean? You still have it. It's just asleep. It's still there. It's just inactive. I wish somebody got that. So while the devil's playing with your mind, you no longer have it. It's no longer there. You, I, 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 I came tonight to tell somebody, you still have it. It's still inside of you. It, it, it's still, it's still right there. But it, 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 it's been, it, it's just been there. It's been stagnant. So someone needs to hear this tonight. God is saying, if you just remember, if you just remember, if you just remove. And if you just repent, I will return a hundredfold. I will restore. I will give you your dignity. I will give you your joy. I will return your purpose. In other words, this is what God was telling the church. If you do this, if you do this, I in return will do this. There are talents in this church. There are talents in this church. But there are also hidden talents in this church. Come on, not talents are visible. Talents are things that we can see. But hidden talents is a true story. There are people that have hidden talents. There are talents that are given by God. But, but for whatever reason, it, it's not being put to use. This church is a church that has talents, that has a calling, that has been anointed and that has been appointed by God. But I want to speak to those hidden talents. I don't know what life has done to you. I don't know what you've gone through. I don't know what, what, what journey you've gone through. But you have hidden talents that need to come out. That need to come out. That they need to give birth. Yes. They need to flourish. Yes. And the only way how that's going to happen is if you begin to return to your first love. Yes. It's if you begin to realign your mindset. If you begin, if you begin to check yourself. Yes. It's that gradual process where you're like, oh, this is where I messed up. This is where I trusted that person. This is where I said that. And you begin to examine yourself and you begin to realize the areas that need to be improved <laughs> when I was uh, in uh, studying school um, I, I always thought that my talent was to sing I always said I'm going to be a singer I'm going to travel I'm going to record music I was my talent I was like I'm down I'm going to sing and I will never forget that I was in a church in South Texas and I was I was leading worship. I was leading worship and I was just jamming. I was like on fire and I was just singing my heart out. And a good friend of mine passed away years ago. She 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 was a friend of mine and she literally got up in the middle of the worship and said, Joel, in my ear, that's not your calling. <laughs> Step down, let me finish for you. That hurt me, that crushed me, but it opened my eyes. <laughs> Let me tell you something right now in your church. You should thank God for true friends that will tell you the truth and not tell you what you want to hear. Because if she would have never told me that, I would have never pursued preaching. I would have never pursued teaching. Because my whole mind said, I'm going to sing and I'm going to sing. But because she told me that, I was able to open my eyes and say, okay, God, if that's not it, then what is it? You see, sometimes God can say, that's not it. You're pursuing someone else's calling. That's not your calling. Those are not your gifts. Don't, don't try to be like that preacher. Don't try to be like that person. Yeah. Be who I have created you Amen. to be. Be yourself. Yeah. What I have given you is unique. The talents that I have given you are yours. They belong to you. They have your name on it. it it's yours. I trusted you with those gifts. Don't try to fill that person's shoes. Don't, don't try to walk in those footsteps. Walk in my footsteps. Walk in my direction. Walk in my purpose. Walk in my identity. And I strongly believe, church, this is what led to revival. 
I want, I want to ask you guys to stand to your feet if you want this. I, I, I truly think that everything begins with changing the way you think. Because I've always said this, if, if you cannot respect yourself, never expect for anyone else to respect you. If you do not value yourself, do not expect for anyone else to value you. This whole process was going to begin as an acknowledgement, but it was going to be also begin with correction, but at the end it was going to be a calling of restoration. And this is what I love about God, that even though they dropped the ball, even though they messed up, his promises were still intact. I want you to close your eyes for a second, if you will, please. I want you to think about this. Where, 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 where did it begin? Where did this walk with God begin? But I also want you to ask yourself, at, at what point, where did I lose it? Where did I drop it off? Where did I put it on hold? Where did I stop? At, at what point... It, what, at what point what I, what, did I just get used to this? I just got used to clapping. I got used to singing. I got used to doing this, but I no longer have passion for it. At what point did I get married and, and I just lost it? I, I no longer have it. Because remember the word first love is you have left it. Never said you have lost it. You left it. It's not lost. You just left it. And God is so great that he will allow you to pick it up again. Just, just continue where you stopped. Move forward where you left off. That's the greatest thing about God. That you can put on hold five, ten years on God. Like, okay, you're ready to move forward? I'm ready. Let's go. Close our eyes for a second if you would. Father God, teach us to be that church. Teach us to be that church. God, I pray tonight for those souls that have an outstanding balance. That have the mindset of, God, I owe you. But the greatest thing about this, God, is that you can pay it in full. Because it's not ours, it belongs to you. Yes. So if you're here tonight and you feel like you have this outstanding balance with God, it's like you almost owe God interest. God is so merciful that he's willing to remove the balance. That he's willing to liquidate what we owe just so he can continue what he once started inside of us. He has so much invested in you to stop now. Someone needs to hear this. He has so much invested in you to stop now. So why hear the voice of the enemy when the voice of the Holy Spirit is speaking to you? Why hear the voice of man when there's a voice of a creator speaking to you right now? He's here, church. He's here. Do you remember when you used to break before the altar? Do you remember when you didn't care that the last person left? You were still here because you just wanted not a touch. You didn't want a touch. You wanted to experiment his presence. Do you remember those moments that the song was stopping? You're like, no, 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 the next song. Play the next song. Please, just, just, just keep ministering, keep preaching. He wants to take you back, not to those days, but to greater days, to greater moments, to greater experiences, to new ones. If you're ready for that, and that's you, I want you to leave your chair for a second. I want you to come to this altar. If you want to bow down, you can bow down. If you want to raise your hands towards heaven, you can do so. But begin to do what you haven't done in a long time. I'm going to say this again. Begin to do what you have not done in a long time. 
It's not time to say, well, this person made me. No, 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 no. It's just between you and God. This altar is open. Just you and God and no one else.